my foot got trapped in it, and then I did like a backflip off of it and broke my foot. I think we were feeding our birds one time, and they never knew that the cave was haunted. But I found it and tried to give it to her, but she said no. It's time for the apple seed. In every episode of the show, we hear great storytellers tell great stories that we hope will spark great conversations between you and the people you love. We hope these stories inspire you and your family to share your own stories with each other. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and today on the show, we're focusing on a special kind of story. And let me see if I get this right. Stories about listening to stories told to us. That's simple enough, right? We got a handful of stories today from people who are inspired by listening to the stories other people tell and how that leads them to big things, discovery and connection. And first up, we're going to hear from the Reverend Robert B. Jones. We've featured Robert on the show before. You might remember him as the blues-loving pastor from Detroit, whose stories are woven through with performances of terrific music. He'll tell us about a storyteller who inspired him to learn more about his own family. She would polish off every story with the words, These are your family stories. If you don't tell them, they'll get lost. And wouldn't that be a shame? That's just a moment from the story Song for Great Grandfather from the Reverend Robert B. Jones. And because it's Robert Jones, there might just be a song in it for you in addition to a story. And after Robert Jones, we'll share a conversation with a doctor named Danielle Ofri. She's written books and given TED Talks about how important it is for doctors to listen carefully to the stories of their patients. And Dr. Ofri has some dramatic stories of her own about her patients trusting her with their stories. You know, it's a perilous thing. You're now holding this story. You you are now a character in the story. Whether you want to be or not, whether you believe in it or not, you're holding your patient's story. That was just a moment from an interview with doctor and author Danielle Ofri, a moment in which she realizes how she has been pulled into the story of a patient's life and death struggle. And after that, we'll present our adaptation of a famous short story about a sleigh driver with a desperate need to share his sad story with his passengers, but none of them will bother listening to him. Well, you're a a merry lot. (laughs) Who asked you? And will you speed up that horse of yours? Come on! Just a moment there from our adaptation of Anton Chekhov's short story, Misery, performed before a live audience in the Appleseed studio. That's coming up later in the hour. And for now, let's get started with our first story from the Reverend Robert B. Jones. This is a family story of a hard experience from true life. And we should tell you that it contains just a moment of rough language, a racial slur hurled as an insult at Robert's great-grandfather. We honor Robert's family story by letting that part of the story play out, but we thought we should let you know. The story will give you a lot to think about and to talk about, too. Robert is waiting in the Appleseed studio with our terrific live audience, so let's head on in. You know, it occurs to me that I've been talking and singing songs. You know, I love songs to tell stories and stories that, that set up songs and, and all of that good stuff. But the fraternity and the sorority and the family that is storytelling is an amazing family. And um, when I started off, like I said, my repertoire was not that big. So I used to have to tell stories about the songs in order to simply stretch the set. And after I got more songs up under my belt, my friends and my audience would say, keep stories in, we like the stories. So I I kept putting the stories in, right? And uh, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Roy Bookbinder who is still very much alive, very much well, and and is a friend and a mentor one day, he got invited to the National Storytelling Festival, and he, he couldn't do it for whatever reason. It was scheduled because Roy loves to schedule himself right out of the National Storytelling Festival. <laughs> and um, I think he dropped a suggestion that maybe this guy, Robert Jones, that I've been knowing for a few years, he tells a pretty good story, and, and maybe you should call him. So they call me to this storytelling festival. Now, you got to know, I'm from Michigan. 
And Michigan is not the mecca of storytelling, <laughs> for whatever reason, you know? He's like, we're going to have a storytelling festival. And like 14 people show up, you know? So, but I, I find out that in some places, storytelling is huge. And I go there, and all of a sudden, I'm surrounded by storytellers of every stripe, every age, every description, every creed, color. But the one who captures my attention, the first storyteller I get to see up on the stage is 89-year-old Miss Catherine Wyndham. Now, if you've ever heard Miss Catherine tell a story, she was like the dean. She was the mother. She was the godmother of storytellers, right? She's standing there, and she, she, she had on this little straw hat, all four foot nothing of her. And she had on this little purple dress and these orange shoes. And I thought, right then, somebody should help her with her clothing selection. <laughs> but I did not know Miss Catherine at that point. Miss Catherine was an Auburn fan. Those were her Auburn Tiger shoes. And she wore them with any ensemble. And Miss Catherine was the kind of woman that just believed in story, And she was telling these amazing stories about growing up in Alabama and growing up in not just Alabama, but Selma, Alabama, a town that I grew up thinking of as being the, the town that I saw on the newsreels. It's the town I saw Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King marching through, right, and, and being brutalized in. But Miss Catherine told a whole different side of Selma. Miss Catherine told the story of, of her father and how, as he embraced this older man from the black community and as the two of them worked together to, to, to let this man do something that was his lifelong dream. And Miss Catherine is standing there with that little southern, gentle, powerful voice saying, and my father... He gave him $25, and he said to him, go find your wife. I know she was sold away in slavery, but slavery time is over, and you need to find your wife and find out what happened to her. I know you got a new wife, and she has a new husband, but, but, but do that. And, and her father gave this man this little money, and he traveled over the hills and found the woman that he had been married to. And... And, and as they sat together and drank lemonade in the Alabama sun, he told her what had happened in his life, and she told him what had happened in her life. And, and, and I'm sitting there just crying, man. I'm like, that's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> and then she got him back home. And, and she said, and when, when he left, she said to him, you know what? You shouldn't leave empty-handed. Here, take this. And she gave him a rose bush. And he took the rose bush and planted it outside of the library. The library that he never got to use because he never learned to read. But the library that he helped to build. And the library that he helped to furnish with books so the next generation could get what he never had. And I said, Miss Catherine, I want to be a storyteller when I grow up. And that wasn't enough. She would polish off every story with the words, these are your family stories. If you don't tell them, they'll get lost. And wouldn't that be a shame? And I went home and I thought about my grandmother. And, I, you know, I was listening, I was listening to that wonderful story that came about your grandfather. And I have a great grandfather. His name was Will Cunningham. And Will Cunningham came up in a time that was so different from the time that we live in. We, we're so divided now. We, we, we fight about the least little thing. We, we fight about whether we're Democrat or Republican. We fight about whether we're conservative or liberal. We fight about whether we're old and young or black or white. But no matter what we fight about, I thank God the world is not the way it was when my great-grandfather was coming up. I heard the, the great... Pastor Joseph Lowry, who was speaking at a Martin Luther King Day rally, and this young man was like, you know, Pastor Lowry, I'm glad y'all did all that 50 years ago. 
but the world is still bad. It's still hard for black people. There's still police brutality. There's still a lack of employment. There's still lack of opportunities. There's still educational inequities. He went on and on and on, and Pastor Lowry just sat there and looked at him like an old black preacher does. So, well, young man, I hear you. But anybody who thinks that things now is the same as they was then, wasn't around then. So this is for my great-grandfather, inspired by Miss Catherine, because he was around then. Connecticut County, Alabama, 1925. Will Cunningham rode into town to get his week supplies. Now Will was a black man who'd fought in World War I, and he'd faced the smoke and powder, but he never chose to run. He had a favorite scripture whenever times got mean. It was 2 Kings chapter 6, around verse 17. It had helped him back in France when he was far from home saying, Lord, open up our eyes to see we do not stand alone. Cause he never picked his battles and he never chose his friends. When he got up in the morning, didn't know how the day would end. But there were angels all around him and chariots on the wind. And he who stood with him were more than those who rode with them. Will was my great-grandfather and he never learned to bow. When other black men would step aside, Will never figured how. He worked for Boss Mac Binion, who was a hard and wealthy man, cause everywhere you was standing, you were on Mac Binion's land. Now Mac Binion was a white man, but all white men ain't the same. And some will curse you and abuse you and call you out your name. That's the kind Will met that morning when he stepped into the store. Just a ball of hate and evil, and very little more. But he did not pick his battles, and he never chose his friends. When he got up in the morning, didn't know how the day would end. But there were angels all around him, and chariots on the wind. And those who stood with him were more than those who rode with them. When Will Cunningham met evil, he looked evil in the face. Evil says, this is the kind of nigger you gotta put back in his place. So he slapped my great-grandfather to teach him by degrees. But Will answered with a straight right hand and knocked evil to his knees. It was still Connecticut County back in 1925. And you couldn't whoop a white man if you wanted to stay alive. So Will got back on that wagon and he headed out for home. He didn't want Henrietta and the babies to meet that storm alone. Cause he never picked his battles and he never chose his friends. When he got up in the morning, didn't know how the day would end. But there were angels all around him and chariots on the wind. And those who stood with him were more than those who rode with them. Well, evil got his mob together and they passed around the cup. They said, long about midnight, we'll go string that up. And evil had the rifles and evil had the rope. And Will just had a shotgun, but he didn't have much hope. Then boss Mac Binion showed up with his pistol in his hand. He said, I heard y'all gonna try to lynch my hardest working man. Now, I don't know who you worthless trash think you come to kill, but I gladly shoot the man who lays a hand on my man Will. And one by one, they dropped the guns and went into the night. Will lived to see another day he'd won a hopeless fight. And the word of God from World War I had saved him once again. Cause he did not pick his battles and he never chose his friends. Will died in a nursing home 
at the age of 91. And standing at that funeral home was the one who wrote this song. And I tell this old man's story just to pass along, that even when you're by yourself, you never stand alone. You can't always pick your battles or always choose your friends. When you get up in the morning, don't know how the day will end. But there are angels all around us and chariots on the wind. And those who stand with us are more than those who ride with them. Connecticut County, Alabama, 1925. Will Cunningham rode into town to get his week supplies. Reverend Robert B. Jones, with a powerful story and song about his great grandfather, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. In just a moment, a little talk back with our producers, Heather and Brian, about that story, followed by the story of a doctor who discovered the healing power of listening carefully to her patients' stories. That's coming up here on The Appleseed. I'm Sam Payne. It was just our pleasure to hear a musical story shared with us by Reverend Robert B. Jones, the Detroit storyteller and musician, recorded live in the Appleseed studio. And it's my pleasure to chat with uh, the producers of the Appleseed about that story around the desk here. Dr. Brian Tanner, Dr. Heather Bigley. Guys, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, great to be here. Hello. That story is kind of a, a, a difficult story, right? Mm-hmm. I find it to be filled with with darkness and with light. Yeah. You, yeah, you know, and uh, and it was kind of a bracing experience to hear that story. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of wondering where it took you guys. Well, at the same time that it was bracing, I really responded to his heartfelt sentiments about his great grandfather. Yeah. You know, and um, he quoted earlier in there, um, listening to Catherine Tucker Wyndham and her saying, "These are your family's stories, and if you don't tell them, then they they'll just be lost, mm-hmm. and wouldn't that be a shame?" You know. Yeah. And it reminded me of uh, Roots, the book, and mm. the famous miniseries from the sure. 1970. It was a big sensation at the time. And perhaps it didn't remind me of that for the reasons you're thinking, because it, it deals with slavery and very terrible treatment of African Americans. But yeah. also, w- what really resonated with me was the way that the author, Alex Haley, he went back and really studied his forefathers, you know, Mm -hmm. and foremothers, and learned, who are these people? He didn't just stop when, oh, I found the dates that they were buried and the the dates they were born and where they lived. It was like, I I want to get to know who these people are. And just going through this experience and seeing Chicken George and Kizzy and Kunta Kinte, you know, these are people who are just like bursting with life. And Mm -hmm. he went back and he, he watched, he learned as much as he could about them. And I remember watching this and I just... I'm kind of getting emotional thinking about it. I just had like tears streaming down my face and mm-hmm. I picked up the phone and I called my parents and I said, hey, how can I learn about my ancestors? Mm-hmm. <laughs> As it says in the Bible, there's something about, you know, the the hearts of the children being turned towards their fathers. Yeah. And I felt like that really kind of helps me it, this pivotal moment as a college student kind of figuring out who I am to look back mm-hmm. at my family and say, oh, that's where I come from. That's <laughs> and it's a, this is my story. And it's a careful story rendered by somebody outside of your experience that turned your heart in that yeah, exactly. direction. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. You hear echoes of that same kind of storytelling in what we just heard from Robert B. Jones, don't you? That family story. Yeah. yeah. How about mm-hmm. you, Heather? Well, I, you know, I'm really caught by this being a story told through music, mediated through music. And mm-hmm. I'm really interested in how here we have this very difficult experience being related, but the music that is being used is this driving, energetic, like, it's empowering music. This is not music of someone who, you know, was caught unawares or music of someone who is a victim or or 
or anything like that. It's, it's like not, it's not sorrow music. This is sorrow music. or ballad. This yeah. is this is power rock. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and I love that. And I love that the story is about a man who uh, stands up for himself and then realizes there are going to be consequences, horrible consequences, to that, and runs home to protect his family, and then has someone else show up, hmm. yeah. right, um, to help out. So. Th- to me, it's a really empowering story about, um, you know, being active in your own life and and letting people know how you're going to be treated from the vantage point in a in, in history where this person that Robert B. Jones is telling us about was not allowed to have that kind of mm-hmm. self pride, right? Mm-hmm. Like all the laws were constructed so that he wouldn't, right? This, cultural norms were constructed so that he wouldn't, and yet there he is. Mm-hmm. And to me, that that hard thing is is the bright diamond that shines yeah. and says, this is worth listening to. You know, the story that Robert B. Jones shared with us did bring a memory to mind for me that I'd like to share as today's entry in the Radio Family Journal. The Radio Family Journal with Sam Payne, a tiny little story for you and your family right when you need it, on the Appleseed. My kids used to talk about their dreams at the breakfast table. I always thought, listening to them talk about their dreams, that the stuff they read spilled into secret parts of their brains when they were asleep. The dreams were sometimes funny and sometimes scary and always filled with the kind of adventure that was fun to talk about at the table. My own dreams were less fantastical than theirs, maybe. I dream a lot, and my dreams are often vivid. But unless I write them down, I never remember them for more than a day or two, and they're usually not fascinating to listen to. But every once in a while, I have a dream that seems to mean something, and I remember it. I had a dream some years ago in which I walked up to an old screen door and knocked. In the dream, the door was almost immediately answered by my grandfather, who has been dead now since the century turned. He was deceased in my dream, too, and he knew it, but he wore a broad smile as he turned away from me and marched off through the little house to which the screen door belonged. He called over his shoulder for me to come on in. I followed him to what must have been the living room. On the couches that curved around the perimeter of the room sat my grandmother, who had preceded my grandfather in death by a couple of years, and she looked as old as I ever remember her, but the deep lines of sorrow and illness that I remember were gone. In the living room, she stood and walked across the room with great ease, something that was difficult for her in real life for the twenty years or so before her death. And there were other people in the room, too, uncles that I recognized, every one of them deceased and aware of it, all sitting on the sofas. The conversation that I had interrupted with my arrival now continued. They were reminiscing nostalgically about shared experiences, smiling and chuckling and sharing the look that people share when they've all been through the same similar thing. And much like you and I might talk about a long-ago football game or about prom, they were talking about the shared experience of passing from this life through death and into that undiscovered country that Hamlet described, that country from which none return, the shared experience of their own deaths. There was no ceremony or ritual in the conversation, It didn't seem like they'd gathered with that in mind. It seemed like friendly talk around glasses of lemonade on the coffee table. And that that talk had simply drifted in the direction of chatting about death by the time I walked in. All those folks sharing stories about their deaths in the same way that married couples around the table in a dinner party might share funny or memorable details about their weddings or their receptions or their first high school sweethearts. And that's pretty much it. That's the dream. And I don't know how much breakfast table story value that dream has, but I've been thinking about it for years. I saw this end of each one of those passings, the winding down of each of those lives, the slowing to a stop of each of those bodies. On this end, there were long years of 
pain, moments of genuine emergency, and the dull, persistent sorrow of loss. And that continues even now. But if those old loved ones can reminisce together in some heavenly living room, in genial and mellow tones about their passage through that most irrevocable of calamities, what does that say about the calamity of finishing the project at work that's giving me fits, or of budgeting for that big car repair, or, I don't know, mucking out the chicken coop? May God grant me steadiness enough in the face of life's horrors, whatever they are, to be welcomed back into that living room sometime in my dreams, to lift a cold glass of lemonade from the coffee table, and to reminisce in genial and mellow tones among those whose faces are filled with gentle knowing about the things that I find most fearful here. That, for sure, and that's a good wish, I think. But there's another thing that stays with me from that dream. In the dream, I was happy to listen to the people in that heavenly living room, partly because I saw it as a chance to catch up on things that I missed to listen more carefully to the wisdom and the stories of those folks, my grandparents and uncles and such, than I had when they were all alive. In real life, outside my dreams, I have to admit that for a while at least, they're gone. Gone for a lot longer than simply the next time I dream about them. And while I believe that there will be a reunion for us at some point in some future day, there's the meantime to get through. And in that meantime, whatever light of theirs that I'll use to help me walk the road I'm on now can only be light that I gathered while they were with me. There are stories, there's wisdom and experience of theirs that I need. And I hope that I paid enough attention while they were here to have stored up enough of it. I'd like to be able to access all that stuff Even while I'm traveling forward, eyes open and wide awake. The Radio Family Journal of Sam Payne. A tiny little story for you and your family. Right when you need it, on the Appleseed. Thanks for joining me for that entry in the Radio Family Journal. We always hope that the stories that we bring you here on the show spark memories and thoughts for you that you can share with the people that you love around the kitchen table or the living room. That kind of storytelling can make for memories that last a lifetime. A pleasure to be around the table with uh, Heather Bigley and Brian Tanner. Guys, thanks so much for joining me to talk about this Robert B. Jones story. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Lots more coming up on The Appleseed. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you on this episode of The Appleseed. Today we're sharing stories about the power of listening to the stories of others. And our next story came to us through one of our assistant producers, Trent Horton, who was a pre-med student. And here on the show, we love sharing different ways that storytelling is happening out in the world. And Trent pointed us to an article written by a doctor about what she calls one of the most sophisticated methods of providing care for patients— listening to their stories. We hope you enjoy our conversation with her. Let me introduce you to Dr. Danielle Ofri. My name is Danielle Ofri. I'm a primary care doctor at Bellevue Hospital, which is the oldest public hospital in the country. And I'm also a clinical professor of medicine at NYU School of Medicine. And I've been doing primary care now for about 20-ish years. When she first started her journey to becoming a doctor... Her plan was to pursue research in neuroscience, but when she started a residency as a doctor of internal medicine, something changed for her. I fell in love with the patients and their stories. She started meeting such interesting people, and their stories motivated her to pursue primary care so she could continue those relationships. It really got me going toward primary care in which you take care of patients for years, sometimes decades, and of course, Patients have their stories, and I love that the stories have many chapters and are not just short interactions. These stories started teaching Danielle something about people and about how to care for them. 
She has shared a lot of these lessons and insights in her books, in other written pieces, TED Talks, and more. And one of these insights was about communication. I started to notice in, in my clinical practice that there were so many miscommunications yeah. in what each of us were trying to, the stories that each of us were trying to tell. And sometimes the story was very different. The story that mattered to the doctor may not be the same story that mattered to the patient. You know, the doctor's story might be about the patient's hypertension or heart disease, but the patient's story isn't anything about that. It's about their sick child back in their home country or the aging parent who is struggling or their own struggles that loom far larger in their minds and their stories than their blood pressure or their diabetes level, which is so powerful for us, the caregivers in medicine. And and that mismatch, I think, leads to a lot of what we find problematic in, in healthcare, patients' frustrations, doctor shopping, burnout for nurses and doctors. And the cure for this miscommunication, you might be surprised, but it's simple. Conversation. So much, we love technology in medicine and I love technology. I'm no Luddite. I love my MRIs and echocardiograms, but most of them, they do one thing in one way and they cost a lot of money to do it. But a conversation can do many things. In fact, Dr. Ofri says that many diagnoses can be made through conversation and by understanding a patient's history. Not only that, but conversation can start treating the patient then and there. So if you think about a disease like diabetes, Most of diabetes treatment is in conversation. It's helping patients uh, figure out what in their lifestyle might be making their sugar higher, helping them to transition to maybe a healthier diet. All of these things are in the conversation. The whole treatment of diabetes is a conversation, an ongoing conversation, an ongoing story for patients, as it is for so many of our chronic illnesses today. And this applies to all sorts of diseases like emphysema, congestive heart failure, depression, and more. Good treatment starts and ends with good conversation. I mean, I can't think of any other medical technology that can do so many things, not to mention build a doctor-patient relationship, a therapeutic alliance, build trust, talk about end-of-life care, decide whether to do a treatment, which one to do. All of these very sophisticated decisional analyses, all in, in conversation, I can't think of another medical tool that can do so many things so flexibly and, and honestly in a quite a sophisticated manner. Beyond using and understanding stories to help treat her patients, Dr. Ofri also explains that sharing her stories allows for a healing of her own. Being a doctor can be stressful, it can be demanding. Writing her stories down, sharing them with others, it's helped her digest and process her experiences, serving as a refresh for the next day and the next patients. She once had a patient that came in with an emergency, an old woman who was short of breath. So they started with an x-ray to try to figure out what was wrong. We couldn't tell just from the x-ray whether it was her lung cancer had returned or whether this was a pneumonia uh, or some infection, which of course are two very different things. You know, an infection usually can be treated in a couple of days. If it's a return of lung cancer, that's a much more serious and and probably deadly uh, diagnosis. And she was very short of breath. It was clear that she would have to be intubated, put on a breathing machine quite quickly. But before she goes on the breathing machine, where she won't be able to talk, she has something to say. As we're telling her about this, she starts to essentially dictate her last will and testament to us and tell us, who she wants to give her paintings to and who to give her household china and linens to. So Dr. Ofri starts writing these things down, trying to record everything this woman is telling her about which cemetery she wants to be buried in, about who to contact. And finally, they get a notary to come in and sign off on what could be the patient's final words. Just as we're about to intubate her, she looks at me and says, seven days, that's all I want on the machine. If I don't get better, take it out. And I'm looking at my team and, and, you know, seven days. Well, in seven days, if it's an infection, you know, we have a good chance of, you know, treating that and she can get better. But if it's cancer, seven days isn't going to do it. And, you know, that could be your last day if she wants us to take it out. Um, And she, you know, looks at us and says, you must promise me that you take it out in seven days, you know, no matter what. And after they put her on the machine... Dr. Ofri and her team are left standing there looking at each other, sharing the knowledge 
that they could be the bearers of this woman's last words here on earth and that it's something they might have to carry the rest of their lives. I remember when I went home that night, I felt like my my soul was in pieces. I really felt it torn apart. And I had this just nervous energy. I had to do something. She says that she could have done many things to try and relieve the stress of what she had experienced. But for some reason, the thing she wanted to do was put the whole experience on paper. But this was the first time in real time that I felt this urge to write. And and what I did is I wrote an email to my my best friend and I kind of emailed like, you know, gosh, you will never believe the day I had. Here's what happened to me today. And she didn't immediately get a response back from her friend, but she did feel like writing the email helped. It was enough to have written the story. I needed to, to get it down even if no one could comment on it or or talk back to me, getting it down was what I needed to stitch those pieces of myself back together because I had to go back to the hospital the next day. I had a function for this patient, for all my patients. And, and so just the telling of the story was enough to to get me there. And so as she has written down the stories of her interactions with patients, she's always aware of the care that needs to be taken in sharing them. Through her teaching and publications, she has worked to make sure that future generations of doctors understand that a patient's story is powerful and that it'll look different to everyone involved. Sometimes my analogy is the EKG. So an electrocardiogram is, if you can imagine, a heart in the center of seven or eight cameras from different angles. And they each take a picture of the heart. This is an electrical picture. It's all the same heart, but the a view looks quite different from each one of these cameras. And that's what often happens in a story, that there are many people in the story, they're all witnessing the same events, but they see it from a different camera. So to recognize that they're all truth, but truth from a different perspective. We want to thank Danielle Ofri for sharing her story. And you can find her books, articles, and links to her TED Talks at her website, danielleofri.com. That's O-F-R-I, Ofri. In the course of our conversation with Dr. Daniel Ofri, she mentioned a short story that she often shares with her students to help them learn the power of listening to their patients. The story is called Misery, and it's written by the famous 19th century writer Anton Chekhov. At the time of the interview, we were unfamiliar with the story, but afterward we looked it up and we were kind of moved by it. We decided that we would end our show today by gathering some actors and a live audience in the Appleseed studio to perform an adaptation of that short story. Let's head back to the studio where our producer, Brian Tanner, will start us off with a little introduction. When people say that misery loves company, it's usually a bad thing. It means that people who are miserable love to drag other people down with them. But when we're feeling miserable, having someone to listen to our stories, even if they can't do anything to fix things, can be deeply cathartic. The author Anton Chekhov, who's often considered one of history's greatest writers of plays and short stories, was very sick with tuberculosis over a span of several years in the 1880s. However, he refused to tell his family or doctors about his condition. And perhaps it was this period of sickness and secrecy that inspired him to write a short story called Misery about Iona, a lowly sleigh driver in St. Petersburg who carries the burden of a personal tragedy, and he has a desperate need to talk to someone about it. Now, the pioneering psychologist Carl Jung, who was just born a generation after Chekhov, was famous for saying, Loneliness does not come from having no people around you, but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to you. There are Ionas around us every day who are dealing with loss or illness or depression or loneliness or all manner of difficulties. Who will listen to their stories? Well, here on The Appleseed, we always invite our listeners to share their stories, but we also hope that you open your hearts and your ears to the stories that other people share with you. And now The Appleseed presents our adaptation of the short story Misery by Anton Chekhov.
It is twilight in St. Petersburg in the winter of 1886. Big flakes of wet snow whirl lazily about the street lamps, which have just been lighted. Iona Potapov, the sleigh driver, is all white like a ghost, covered in a layer of fresh snow. He perches on his seat in the sleigh without stirring, his body bent over in despair. If a snowdrift fell on him, it seems as though he wouldn't even notice, let alone shake it off. And his little mare is white with snow, and motionless, too. It's a long time since Iona and his horse have budged. They came out of the yard before dinner time and have not had a single passenger yet. But now, the shades of evening fall on the town, and the bustle of the street grows noisier. Slay to the city center! Slay! Iona starts and through his snow-plastered eyelashes, sees an officer in a military overcoat with a hood over his head. To the city center. Are you asleep, man? To the center. At last, Iona registers the officer's request. The officer gets into the sleigh. He gives a tug at the reins, which sends cakes of snow flying from the horse's back and shoulders. Get up. <laughs> Iona fidgets in his seat as though he were sitting on thorns. He jerks his elbows and turns his eyes about as though he did not know where he was or why he was there. What rascals these pedestrians are, doing their best to get trampled under the horse's feet. Iona turns his head toward his passenger. Uh, I... Uh, what? My son, uh, my son died this week, sir. What did he die of? Iona turns his whole body round to his passenger. Oh, who can tell? It, it must have been from fever. He he lay three days in the hospital and then he died. God's will. Turn around, you lunatic. Look where you're going. Drive on. Drive on. At this pace, we won't get there until morning. Hurry up. Iona looks back at the officer several times as they ride in silence. But the officer keeps his eyes shut and appears disinclined to listen. After dropping his passenger off at the city center, Iona stops outside a restaurant and again sits huddled up on the seat of his sleigh, awaiting his next fare. As he waits, the wet snow once again paints him and his horse white. One hour passes and then another, and finally... A couple of noisy revelers approaches the sleigh. <laughs> Cabby! Cabby, to the police bridge. The pair of us. Twenty kopecks. <laughs> Iona knows that twenty kopecks is not a fair price, but he isn't thinking about that. Whether it is a ruble or five kopecks does not matter to him now that he at last has company. <laughs> Look at that cap on the cabbie's head. You wouldn't find a worse cap in all of Petersburg. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, nothing to boast of. <laughs> uh, are you going to drive like this all the way? Hey, shall I give you a little smack on that cap of yours to speed you up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my head aches. Yesterday, Vasca and I drank four bottles of brandy between us. You liar. Why would you make up stories like that? I swear it's the truth. You think I was born yesterday? Uh, well, you're a, a merry lot. <laughs> Who asked you? And will you speed up that horse of yours? Give her a good one with the whip. Come on, give it to her. Fiona feels behind his back the jostling of the revelers in their seats. He hears their elaborate strings of verbal abuse addressed to him until one of them is overpowered by a coughing fit. <coughs> Despite the abuse, the feeling of loneliness begins little by little to lift from his heart in the presence of other people. The revelers speak of the latest scandal involving the daughter of the Grand Duke. Iona looks around at them, waiting till there's a brief pause in the conversation. This week, uh, my... My son died. We shall all die. <coughs> <coughs> Come on, drive on, drive on. 
Oh, I simply cannot stand crawling like this. Well, maybe you should give him a little encouragement. One shot right to the back of his neck. Ah, oh, you hear that, cabbie? I'll make you smart. At this rate, we may as well walk the rest of the way. Do you hear me, old man? Or do you care a hang what we say? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> Iona hears, rather than feels, the slap on the back of his neck. <laughs> well, you sure are a merry lot. God give you health. Cadman, are you married? I? <laughs> oh, the only wife for me now is the damp earth. Uh, the grave, that is. Uh, my son's dead, and I am alive. Death has come in at the wrong door. Instead of me, it went for my son. Know how he died? <coughs> <coughs> at last, we've arrived. The revelers throw him the measly 20 kopecks as they jump out of the sleigh. Iona gazes for a long while at the revelers, who disappear into a dark doorway. The misery, which has been eased by the mere presence of other people, returns and tears his heart more cruelly than ever. Iona's eyes stray restlessly among the bustling crowds on both sides of the street. Can he not find among those thousands someone who will listen to him? At that moment, Iona sees a house porter with a parcel and makes up his mind to address him. What time is it, friend? Oh, about ten o'clock. But wait... Why have you stopped here? Drive on! Iona drives a few paces on, bends his body over double again in despair. He feels it's no good to appeal to people, but before five minutes have passed, he draws himself up, shakes his head as though he feels a sharp pain, and tugs at the reins. He can bear it no longer. Back to the yard. Trot to the yard. And his little mare, as though she knew his thoughts falls to trotting. An hour and a half later, Iona sits by a big dirty stove. All around him, by the stove, on the floor, and on the benches, there are fellow sleigh drivers snoring. The air is full of smells and stuffiness. Iona looks at the sleeping figures and regrets that he has come home so early. I have not earned enough this night to pay for the oats even. That's why I'm so miserable. A man who knows how to do his work, who has had enough to eat, and whose horse has had enough to eat is always at ease. In the corner, a young cabman gets up, clears his throat sleepily, and makes for the water bucket. Getting a drink? <clears throat> <clears throat> Seems so. May it do you good. But, uh, my son is dead, mate. Do you hear? This week in the hospital, I it's a strange business. Well, the young man has covered his head over and is already asleep. Just as the young man had been thirsty for water, Iona thirsts for speech. His son will soon have been dead a week, and he's not really talked to anybody yet. He wants to talk of it properly with deliberation. He wants to tell how his son was taken ill, how he suffered, what he said before he died, how he died. He wants to describe the funeral and how he went to the hospital to get his son's clothes. He should find a listener that would sigh and exclaim and lament with each detail. Let's go out and have a look at my mare. There is always time for sleep later. You'll have sleep enough, no fear. He puts on his coat, goes into the stables where his mare stands. He thinks about oats, about hay, about the weather. He cannot think about his son when he's alone. To talk about him with someone is possible, but to think of him and picture him is insufferable anguish. Are you munching? There. Munch away, munch away. Since we have not earned enough for oats, we will eat hay. Yes, I have grown too old to drive. My son... Ought to be driving, not I. He was a real cabman. He ought to have lived. Iona is silent for a while, and then he goes on. That's how it is, old girl. My son, Kuzma Ionovich, is gone. 
He, he's, he said goodbye to me. He went and died for no reason. Now, suppose you had a little colt, and all at once that same little colt went and died. You'd be sorry too, wouldn't you? Well, the little mare munches, listens, and breathes on her master's hands. Iona is carried away by his story and tells the horse all about it. That was our adaptation of Misery, the short story written by Anton Chekhov. It was performed before a live studio audience and featuring Anthony Buck as Aona, Ben Butters and Justine Kitteringham as the various passengers, and our terrific Appleseed studio audience members as the bustling holiday crowds. We got them in on the act, too. Thanks for joining us today on The Appleseed, where great stories can change your family's world. And before we go, we wanted to say thank you to those of you who have taken the time to send an email to the show or leave us a thoughtful review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also engage with us on our social media channels. And a listener named Jean Marshall sent us a note on Facebook that said she had appreciated the story we told in another episode about Igor Stravinsky's piece, The Soldier's Tale. She said the piece made her think about her grandmother. And, in fact, she had written a poem about her grandmother that she shared with us. And I share it with you here with Jean's permission. It's called Another Language. It goes like this. She was five when her mother died, locked out by the new one. She forgot what she knew of the vocabulary of the heart. Later, the young girl left her beloved fjords and sailed to America to become my grandmother, hands on her hips, and to my small self, she seemed blunt and imperious, brusque, her tactless English accented with a Scandinavian melody, and those impossible J's softened to Y's. Nevertheless, she knitted a little red sweater and a square-shaped Norwegian cap for me. That was love, I see now in a language of needles and yarn, a word perhaps unutterable in English, but in her mother tongue, Yai Elskerdai. Jean Marshall, we love that you would share that with us. Thank you. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. You can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.